Good morning, everybody. It is, uh, I should always check the date before I push that button. It is August 10, uh, 2022. Glad you're all here. And um, it's been fun to chat with you a little bit ahead of time on the YouTube um, comments. So um, welcome from all over. You all are coming in from all over the place. Colorado, right down the road. Uh, Verena and Sally, who used to live in Colorado but moved to Washington. And the UK, where apparently it's still hot. Um, Hillary also. Uh, Nan in New York, also apparently still hot. Oh my gosh, yeah, Hillary, no AC, I guess in the UK and even Europe, AC is not common, so I'm so sorry. Um, um, apparently Rhode Island is cool. Colorado is hot again this week, but it's pretty normal for this time of year to be in the 90s, so that's 90s Fahrenheit, of course. Um, Hilly from the Netherlands and uh, Mary from Wisconsin, Julia from Germany, welcome. Also very hot there. I have friends in Germany I was just talking to and they said it's just been horrible, so I'm so sorry. Again, no air conditioning. Um, we have a lot of air conditioning in the United States, I think. Um, yeah, probably some energy issues there, but uh, yeah, a lot of air conditioning here. Not everybody has air conditioning, but um, a lot of people do. Um, good morning from Healdsburg Wine Country, California, and Santa Fe, Naya. I um, used to live in Santa Fe, wonderful place. Laura from Florida. Um, let's see. Cool. It's great that you're all here. Thank you. Um, oh, cool. I'm learning about turtles. Laura is from Florida. And um, turtle patrols, when you get out early in the morning to the beach and rope off the area where they've laid their eggs. Um, that's very cool. Actually, I would love to see that. So I'll have to go to Florida at some point and see the turtles. Uh, or, you know, participate in keeping the uh, baby turtle eggs from being destroyed. Um, no AC in Hawaii either. I guess I can imagine you wouldn't necessarily have AC in the middle of the Pacific. Um, Anna in the UK, you guys living near each other. Um, another heat wave coming to the Netherlands. <laughs> Hello from India, fantastic. Um, tapestry weaving not as common in India in my experience that I know of. Um, and I also always wonder if that's, um, at least in part because there's not a lot of wool in India. Um, but you can weave tapestry with cotton. Anyway, I'm glad you're all here. I um, left the uh, list here at the top so I'd remember <laughs> what I wanted to talk about. If you want to leave a donation for Change the Shed to keep it free and on YouTube, um, that is the page. If you go to my website, look under online learning and you'll see Change the Shed and there's a black button there um, for donations. And to all of you who have donated in the last um, years, but especially the last since the last time I asked, um, thank you so much. It really actually makes a big difference. It means that I can pay for the technology and the time it takes to do it. So I really appreciate those of you who have donated tiny amounts or big amounts. It doesn't matter. It's very sweet of you. Um, and if you can't donate at all, totally fine. Please still come. Don't feel like I'm saying you have to donate to um, do this. I do it so that everybody has some access to educational things about tapestry. So um, definitely don't feel like it's a requirement to donate to watch this. You can watch all you want if you can't afford to donate. If you can, it would be fantastic to have um, any little bit of help. And a lot of you have donated many, many times. I really appreciate you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, I can click these off as I cover them. I just wanna say, for, I know a lot of you here are in Summer of Tapestry. That class has a live Q&A, two of them this week. So look in the class if you didn't know that um, and register. Live Q&A, that'll be fun. We're going to look at what people have been weaving and um, have a good chat about it. So that class has been amazing. You can actually still sign up if you're interested in um, jumping in and seeing what the prompts and stuff have been, but it's been really fun. And then the dye class also has a live Q&A this week if you are in that class. Um, 
go back to the class and register and you'll see all the details there. So if you are into um, my acid wool dyeing class, which has also been really fun, we're doing a live Q&A on, I think that one's on Friday. Um, details in the class and you do have to register for those. So um, get in there and do it. All right, today, um, yeah, look, that was my whole list. Good for me. Um, Hopefully you can hear me. I think you would tell me if you couldn't. So I'm trying a new microphone today and so far it seems to work. Um, I noticed listening to the recording from two weeks ago that um, because this table I'm using is plastic, every time I put a tool down, you can hear a thunk on the, I think that's been happening for years, but when I use this table in particular, the sound isn't good. So I'm gonna try a different mic and see if we can make that um, go away. Awesome. All right, good morning, you guys. Those of you who are jumping on, Oregon, um, Vancouver, Canada. I saw a couple of you from Canada, Harold and Sharon, um, Colorado. Yep, Mari in Hawaii, no AC. Um, Paula from the UK, Jennifer from Joshua Tree. I love that you live there. What a beautiful place. Um, I love Joshua Tree National Park, and I just think those trees are amazing. Um, Maryland and uh, the UK again, very hot. So sorry, you guys. Uh, Bainbridge Island, Barbara, I love, just love um, that part of the country. And uh, Jean found the chat. Go, Jean. Um, yeah, I don't know the vagaries of um, YouTube in terms of where the chat is, when, depending on what device you're using. But if you have a YouTube account, you can um, comment. I actually am not 100% sure you have to have an account. So if you don't have an account, try commenting and see if it works. Otherwise, um, if you have other Google accounts, it's just a one more step to get a YouTube account. And if you do get a YouTube account, you can... Um, subscribe to my channel. So if you have a YouTube account, please do that. It really helps me out if you hit the subscribe button. And you also will, if you want to get notifications. Um, like if you like Change the Shed, there's a little bell. You can get a notification to remind you that, oh, hey, Change the Shed is today. So, oh, the next Change the Shed will be in September before I forget. Um, I'm gonna take, um, the rest of August off to work on some other projects, but I'll be back in September and I'll put those dates on the website and it's in my newsletter and all the things. So um, I'll be back uh, in about, probably about four weeks. So in the meantime, do a bunch of weaving and we'll see what you're up to. All right, I brought today a tapestry that you have seen several times. Um, it is, this uh, Icelandic tapestry. And I have done, um, oh yeah, you can't really see what that is, can you? I'm weaving this one from the back because I'm using a particular join that works best from the back. So let me show you the front. Um, this piece, if you haven't seen me weave on this before, this piece is from Iceland. It's the fourth Icelandic piece I've done from my artist residency using all Icelandic wool. And um, this one came, I'll just show you again. Um, this one came from some places that I visited in Iceland when I was doing an artist residency there in April. Um, this came from two different, the windows in Iceland are very cool in the buildings and so, um, in Skagestrand, there is, I was up in Blandos, which is in the north part of the country. I was there for a month and there's lots of windows. And this is a little town called Skagestrand. And there's, this is just a bank of windows that I saw there that I really um, liked. There's tons of, uh, the buildings of course in another country are different and the architecture is different. And so I really enjoyed a lot of the windows there. So this piece comes from that, those windows and this, um, lighthouse we went to and this lighthouse had uh, um, these huge tall um, strips on the side with little bits of glass in them and I don't know you know on the inside what um, what that looks like but I was uh, really enjoyed the looking at this glass and up close it's these little bits of I think it's glass 
um, many of them are broken. So it was interesting to see that. And so that is where this little tapestry came from. I'm weaving it with um, this yarn. This is not hand spun. Most all the ones I've done before are hand spun, but this one is not. This is from Gilhai um, Mill, which is a mill that we went to in the north of Iceland. And this is their lamb singles, which is um, a really, really beautiful yarn. It's perfect for tapestry. Um, don't know, um, they don't make a lot of this particular yarn. Most of their yarn is two ply, but um, if you're in Iceland or they do supply several different shops in Iceland, or if you can go to their mill, um, they love to have visitors. So that was really fun. And um, yeah. So I'm going to weave on this a little bit. Let's see what your, and you can ask me questions about whatever you want. <laughs> Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Um, she says, I hope you've taken a vitamin pill for all your live sessions this week. I have, I have, um, four or maybe five live things happening this week, but it's okay. It's, um, it's kind of nice to get them all. Sometimes I do it on purpose. You sort of get them all grouped and you get in a groove of talking to people. And then at the end of it, you're exhausted for a few days, but it should be fun. It's inspiring to see what everyone is weaving and, um, what's happening in the various classes. So it, it's a fun thing to do. Hello from uh, London, Fredrita from a town near London, England. Um, Virginia is here and steamy Florida and hot and dry South Dakota and uh, Central Texas. I bet Central Texas is hot. Um, so yeah, I'm going to weave on this a little bit. This is a pipe loom that I made and I've got a couple things going on these pipe looms. The bad thing about pipe looms, not a bad thing, but is that you can make them so easily that you end up with a whole collection of them, which is my problem. Um, but they're cheap to make, so I guess it's not a horrible problem. This, um, if you've seen me weave on this before, I'm doing the same sort of thing. I want to shift this color in this little sort of broken glass idea here on the side. Um, that is um, the only hand spun in the piece. The rest of it is this Gil Hai, um singles wool, but there is some hand spun in this little glass piece, which you can tell is much more regular than the mill spun yarn, but I liked the color of it. So managing this little join here, which is giving me that really straight line. This is, um, I call it the James Kohler join. It's got other names. It's not a proprietary join. I just was taught it by my teacher, James Kohler. And so I've now taught it as the James Kohler join, which might be confusing, but it's just a particular weft interlock. And there, I do have a couple of YouTube videos about it. If you're interested in this join, um, it's really, really straight if you set it up right. So that's why I use it. That's why James used it. He had a lot of frames in his pieces with long, long upright verticals and the um, join is quite straight. It's actually a lot easier to keep this straight than a sewn slit. Um, the slits tend to wobble a little bit and the uh, join is quite straight because of the way it's set up. So. Um. All right, so I'm just sort of hatching this little yellow color around. Moving it around a little bit. Welcome, um, don't know your name, but Apple369. Welcome to your first Change the Shed. So glad you're here from Vancouver, BC. Um, this is a copper pipe loom and I did make it. And there are, um, I actually have a blog post about how to make your own. 
this and the galvanized pipe loom. Um, if you go to my blog, there's a category list that on the side or on the bottom, depending on what device you're using. And one of the categories is looms. So go there and you should be able to find a blog post about how to make these. I think the post talks about soldering the corners and this loom is soldered. You can see my really messy soldering here. Um, soldering is, um, if you do it right, the solder won't break. Uh, so it's really, really sturdy, but you can use um, super glue to do the corners. And I've um, taught workshops where we made our looms in the workshop and we just use super glue and yeah, eventually the glue will break, but then you just uh, re-glue it once you finish your piece and it won't affect the piece at all. Um, I'm running out of this little color. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to feather it in or leave a tail. I think I'm going to leave a tail because I have to do this join again and I'm going to end up with the tail in a weird spot with the join. So I'm just going to um, leave a tail and start a new piece. Okay. I have a little, I've sort of stopped following this, but this is my, so here's my original cartoon and I'm weaving from the back. So I had to flip it over. Um, I am right up here and I might I sort of stop following this completely, but I might actually do this where I leave this gap. So I have to think about that as I'm going. Let's make this a little wide again. <laughs> Jennifer, since when is a whole collection of looms a bad thing? Well, not. It's not. Um, there are moments where I stub my toes on looms and I think, oh, I have too many looms. But I get over that. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot. Thanks, Barbara. I forgot that there's instructions in my book. That book right behind me, The Art of Tapestry Weaving, the pink one. Um, also has instructions on how to do the pipe looms. So that's an easy place to find it. Yeah, you all, um, if you haven't tried making a pipe loom, it's really, uh... oh, Deb, you work in a hardware store. You don't have any excuse. You could um, also make a galvanized pipe loom or black pipe loom. It actually costs more. The black pipe or the galvanized pipe costs more than the copper but it's an adjustable loom because you can unscrew it and just add um, different length pipes if you want your loom to be wider or taller or something. I do like the, the pipe looms. They're super portable, like this one, the copper pipe looms. They're really portable. I like to travel with them and um, they're sturdy and um, tension. They have tension is the main thing. I should say for those of you who are new, the advantage of a pipe loom over like a peg loom or something is that they have tensioning and you can tighten your warp up. Can you see this? I'm going to go, let's try that. Um, again, I forgot to get a gray card. Um, hopefully this gray blue isn't too... And I realize my camera is shifting the focus. Let's see if I can make it stop doing that. Okay. Let's bring this all the way over here for fun. Tapestry is such an exciting, riveting, uh, thing to watch. The little decisions are the things that I love. The like little momentary, oh, hmm, what am I going to do with this? Let's try this kind of conversation in my head. I really like that. I have to, I'm holding these up as I, the shed open as I pull this through. If I used a shed stick, I would use the shed to hold it open. Um, because these are singles and I don't want to drag them through the shed. 
Another thing I do on a piece like this is measure a lot because it's really visually deceiving. Like it looks like, to me, it looks like this is getting wider. And so I have to really keep checking. It's two and a half inches. Let's see where I started. I know you can't see this. It's exactly the same width, but to me, it looks like it's spreading out. So I have to make sure I don't overcompensate for that and actually make it draw in because I think it's spreading out when it isn't. Measuring is your friend with tapestry. Keep measuring the width, no matter what loom you're using, unless you have a floor loom with a tapestry beater, um, with a, sorry, with a, a beater where you can actually see whether the warps are getting um, distorted that you're pushing out or pulling in uh, measure frequently. I, I think I have, yeah, I'm a, sh I am, um, I'm a shed off. I have, I ran a workshop in the fall called Fixing Your Sheds, uh, which was really fun and I'm going to run it. And I think it was in March, actually. It was in the spring or winter, whatever you call March. Um, I'm going to run that again sometime soon because it was really fun and, um, a great class to figure out how to fix your sheds. Okay, so this particular join is set up with these two wefts going in the same direction and they're pulling against a raised warp. So right here they lock. So I'm bringing the brown around the gray and then this will go in the shed and then right here, let's see, yeah, you can mostly see that. There's an interlock and this is a raised warp. So it's pulling, this is why I can get it so straight. It's pulling this little um, interlock against a raised warp and that um, is why um, I, can, I, I can keep the interlock straight because I have that guide of the raised warp. This interlock works should be done from the back because it creates a ridge on the on the side facing you. So there's, if you could feel this, there's a pretty prominent ridge right along this, um, where this raised warp is. On the front, it's super smooth. Okay. Bobbins go in um, round edge first. Like this. So here's the other shed. Round edge first, not point edge first. The point is actually for beading. Um, okay. Yep, good. Leslie's used Gorilla Glue on her pipe loom. It holds up really well. Um, the glue, I've been surprised how long the glue will last before it will break. And I think it might even just be temperature changes that makes the glue fail at some point. But, um, oh, Verena, I feel better because um, she just moved recently to Colorado and said that the weavers were amazed, the movers were amazed by the amount of looms and yarn. Yeah, next time I move, um, that's what I'm going to get. Oh, great. Um, the local library is a great place to get my book. So that's fantastic. Um, okay. Oh, good, Mari. Thanks for the... Um, that, thanks for the tip. Okay. I'm sorry if I miss your question and you really need me to um, address it, uh, put it in again. But uh, Mari says she's forgotten the set and the wool I'm using. Yes, this is, oh gosh, now I'm not even sure what the set is. I think it's 10. Yeah, 10 EPI. I'm using a fringeless warp. So these are doubled. It's um, a method of warping where you have a supplemental warp. So I have a, a nice long warp to work on, but the end of the piece will be here. And um, when it comes out the loom, it won't have fringe and stuff. It'll be all finished. Um, Hillary, I'm weaving from the back absolutely because of this join, but there are many reasons to weave from the back. There are many other reasons to weave from the front. And I actually have a bunch of blog posts about that. Um, traditionally tapestry was woven from the back. It's still woven from the back in France. Um, a lot of that I think is just 
there are a lot of practical reasons to weave from the back, including um, joins. If you're doing a double weft interlock, that needs to be done from the back. They use that a lot in France. Um, there's other issues about touching the front of your work. And um, anyway, I'm not going to get into that any further, but there's a, I've written lots of blog posts about this. And I talk about it in the Warp and Weft class um, a little bit, actually. And in my book, I definitely talk about it. Um, I'll be updating that Warp and Weft class um, the rest of this year, and I will be talking more about front versus back because I teach Warp and Weft from the back. Uh, oh, cool. Anja says um, she ordered my book and it was just delivered. <laughs> well, that's good timing. Um, uh, Marla says you're not supposed to, um, she's asking about why you're not supposed to use the pointy edge. Um, I'm not sure the difference with bobbin lace bobbins in my what I know about bobbin lace bobbins is that they have a big end on them. They don't have a point, so I'm not sure about that. Um, but with tapestry bobbins, um, these, these bobbins are intended to be used on... Um, here, let me put my face back on here. These bobbins are intended to be hanging. So they're not normally used... I mean, this is an unusual use of these bobbins. They would normally be hanging from a loom vertically. So an upright tapestry loom is what these bobbins are made for. And um, the you don't want to stab the warp with the point. These Some of these bobbins, these metal tipped ones are very sharp and you could break a warp by stabbing it. So I think the main reason to put the um, blunt end in, first you won't catch a warp and get your shed wrong. And secondly, you won't pierce a warp and break it. Um, so the um, ball end goes in first, the point end is for beading. And when you are weaving on an upright tapestry loom, it's nice to have the tool all in one hand. You pick with one hand, so like I'll pick the shed with this hand, put the bobbin through like this, and then the tool is already in my hand to beat the weft in. It's a very efficient way of weaving, but it's intended for upright tapestry looms of which this is, you know, this is a lap loom, so it's not quite. Um, Elaine, um, the warp has little loops right here. This is the fringeless warp. And if I, here, I'll see if my, will this now focus? Um, this is supplemental warp and this is supplemental warp. Here's the top of the loom. Um, the Fringeless for Salvage Warp, I have a class on that taught by Sarah Sweat. It's a fantastic class and Sarah is amazing. Um, the advantage of that is, um, let's see. You get a piece like this. So uh, let me just take this off so you can see it maybe. A little tiny piece like this comes off the loom and it's finished. There aren't any, there aren't, there's no fringe, there's no hem. It's just done when it comes off the loom. It's like a Navajo piece. It's for salvage, meaning all four salvages are finished when it comes off the loom. And you do that with this um, supplemental warp. It also has the advantage, um, unlike Navajo weaving, of having a shed. So I have this whole shed that's open as I'm weaving and it's really easy to weave. Whereas if this were the top of the piece and I didn't have that um, supplemental warp, it would be very difficult to weave. So there's my plug for the fringeless method of warping. Some of you hate it um, and you've told me that and it's totally fine. It's a little bit fussy to get on, but um, I think it's way, way worth it. Uh... Yes, it's 10 EPI and um, I'm using a fairly thin single, which is a pretty, this single's a little bit, could be a little bit fatter, but um, it's pretty good for this warp set for 10 EPI. Um, 
Sheetha, sorry, I'm probably saying your name wrong, um, is asking about, um, does the carpet loom, is it the same as the tapestry loom? So I use a rug loom, and this may be what you're asking, a countermarch rug loom for my big pieces like the one behind me. Um, rug looms work great for tapestry because they carry a high tension. So I'm guessing a carpet loom might be the same thing. I don't know because I don't know where you are and I don't know what kind of loom you're talking about. But on my blog, I have lots of posts about looms. So I would go there and look at the loom section. Um, small pieces, um, you probably are going to want a tensionable loom. So these copper pipe looms or um, Mirex is a company, M-I-R-R-I-X, that makes tensioning small looms. Um, Schacht. Spindle Company also makes one tapestry loom that I recommend called the Aras. Um, yeah, I should mention that I am, in this case, I'm using the bobbin um, mostly because I don't want to drag the yarn through the warp. The, this is a high tension loom or fairly good tension loom. If I drag that weft back and forth through the warp all the time, it will fray it. When I'm using hand spun especially, I use uh, bobbins. Thanks all of you who are saying the book is great. Um, those of you who don't have it, it's called The Art of Tapestry Weaving and it was published in 2020 and it was um, a lot of fun to write it. So I recommend it, but I wrote it. So uh, Oh, Fred, Frederica, sure, I'll show you the board of little tapestries. Um, <laughs> Jean, she never said she hated it. Now, you don't know I was talking about you, Jean. Uh, we're talking about fringeless. Um, Jean doesn't like, uh, she mentioned that it wasn't her favorite, the fringeless method of warping, and it is very fussy. So those of you who don't like fussy are not gonna like fringeless. If you're willing to learn if you have a lot of patience, it takes a lot longer to warp the loom. So yes, it is fussy. You are right, Jean. This is just a little board of, let's see if I can zoom out. This is one of my tapestry um, diary pieces. And those of you in the summer of tapestry class have seen a whole bunch of these. But yeah, this is, um, I have a whole nother board like this. Um, just over time, this is what um, the summer of tapestry class is actually about, is weaving from um, from a prompt. So these are all just little ones that were from something. The, this top line has, um, I did on purpose to have this like line that goes through all the tapestries and the little snowman is the last one there. Actually, the second line also has that thing here. Let me, I put tags on them so I know when I wove them, but yeah, all the way to the edge, which was fun. Um, so yeah, I talk a lot about that in the summer tapestry class. Some of these, the ones at the end are from 2019. So I have another whole board. Um, they're not completely chronological, but all right. So, um, that is a problem, Nan, with the, f um, when you set up something for salvage, you are deciding how big it is. Like I have to weave all the way to the top of this and I can't weave farther. So if you misjudge your warp or you um, have a jig or you don't have a jig that's the right size or you don't figure out how to make a jig that's the right size, uh, the sizing can be a little bit tricky. Um, got a little technical issue there. Um, I'm now in different sheds, so let's fix that. Let's see if I can get even closer and so you can see that. Hopefully that will stay. Let's fix the shed so we're all in the same. I will be finishing this piece, maybe this weekend. It's 
it's ready to be done. I have other Icelandic um, work I want to do and or work from that Iceland trip and so I need to get this one finished. Okay and here's the interlock and this brown is pulling against this is a raised warp and I could actually if I pick up the shed with a shed stick you'll see that this is a maybe you'll see yeah raised warp. If you're looking for this video in my YouTube channel, it's called the James Kohler Interlock. There's actually two videos. The older one will come up first because it's had a lot more views, but the second video is a lot better. So look for both of them. But um, if you want to learn this technique and you don't have the Warp and Weft or one of the other classes that teaches it, um, look for the second video, the newer one. Uh, my video skills got a lot better. I think that James Kohler interlock, the first one was the first video I ever made. Um, I was testing out a new video camera and uh, you'll, you can tell if you watch the video. All right, let's see, are we all in the same shed now? Let's open the whole shed and just look. Yep, so I, I'm noticing that this is the next shed I need to weave and everything is ready to be woven, so. Let's do it. Oh, Jean, don't feel guilty. Jean and I have gone back and forth a tiny bit on fringeless. I'm telling you, there are people for which fringeless is fantastic, and there are people for which it is not the right thing to do. So do not feel bad if it is not your way. It's fine. We all have techniques we like more than others. Okay. Great. That is working. Um. Audrey's saying, um, she's wondering if the Kohler interlock is as visible as it is tactile, because I generally weave from the front. Um, this join doesn't work really from the front, Audrey. Um, I mean, it works, but you'll, it'll look like the back looks for me. And there is a big ridge on the back. So from the front, it's super straight. This is a fuzzy yarn, so. That is just not focusing. Um, it's super straight, but, uh, oh, now I don't know if I, hold on, sorry. Manual, uh, just turn the focus off. Okay, come on camera. There we go. So the front, it's pretty straight. I mean, it's not perfect, but. Um, I don't do this join when I weave from the front. I mean, I'm weaving from the back so I can do this join. So often I will choose the techniques I'm going to use. I will choose weaving from the front or the back based on the techniques I want to use. Um, I can weave everything from the back, but sometimes I'm weaving something that is more complicated in terms of forms or something, or something that I really want to be able to see better and I have distinct shapes and I don't, I'm not doing a lot of like hatching or something, then I'll just weave it from the front. Most of my small tapestry diary pieces, those ones I just showed you, away from the front. All right, how am I gonna do this shape? Okay, we'll do this. Um, the, a couple of you I saw were asking about the bobbins. The, these brass tip ones I'm using are my favorite. These are called Skinny Minis, and they are made by Melissa Ellison Dewey. And if you go to, um, her website is Bobbin Boy. If you're on Facebook, she actually um, uses Facebook more than anything else. But if you go to Bobbin Boy, either on Facebook or just Google Bobbin Boy, you will find her um, you won't find a lot about the bobbins, but you will find her email and you can email her and she will send you pictures. Um, these are skinny minis. They're the thinnest ones she makes. 
and they're fantastic for small tapestries. She makes ones that are this length, but a little bit fatter, and she makes bigger ones. This bobbin is five inches long. This is four and a half inches. This uh, quilt square is four and a half inches, so it's a five inch bobbin if that helps you say what you want. If you just say you saw skinny minis or your skinny bobbins or whatever on Rebecca's Change the Shed, she'll know what you're talking about. She's a very talented woman who is um, fascinating to follow if you're on Facebook um, because she does all kinds of historic stuff. They, she and her husband are woodworkers, um, among many other things. She's a master fiber artist, but they restore looms and spin, um, spinning wheels. And she will often go to fairs and stuff. She lives in Asheville, North Carolina. She'll often be seen at fairs and stuff dressed in period clothing, using historic equipment. I think she mostly only uses historic equipment. So she's quite fascinating. And I recommend looking her up. Melissa is spelled, um, I think it's M-I-L-I-S-S-A. -S -S and her last name, Dewey, is D-E-W-E-Y. So, Or just look for Bob and Boy. So the thing, Jean, that's a good question. So Jean says, I know I'm always um, two steps ahead of the tapestry police. There are no tapestry police, Jean. I'm going to just do this a second. Um, there are no tapestry police. So don't worry about that. Um, second of all, can't the so she asked, can't the join be done from the front on a lowered warp? You can reverse it, yes. You can do that. The problem is the reason it's so straight is that I am the way I'm doing the join is pulling it against the raised warp. When you flip it over, if you're doing it on a lowered warp, it just you can do it. It works. Um, and I teach that actually in the warp and weft class exactly that way. But it's just um, for me, it's not as straight. I have had students where I've looked at their samplers and thought, "Wow, they don't need this join because they can make every join straight." So it's about being fussy. Um, about how much weft you put into a join and being consistent. You have to be really consistent about which weft goes over the other one and how you tighten the join itself because the, basically a, a weft interlock goes between two warps and does this with the two wefts. So you can, there's lots of weft interlocks and if you're consistent, you can make almost any of them probably about as straight as this one. Um, so that's my answer <laughs> to that one. And don't worry about the tapestry police either. Oh, that's a great, I, a great question, Anja. Um, how do you keep the warps, and I'm probably saying your name wrong, I'm really sorry. How do you keep the warp set from shifting on a pipe loom and how do you keep it where you want it? So here's the tip I use on a pipe loom. Um, let me show you this. So on this loom, let me back out a little bit. Um, on this loom, you can see I've got, well, I have a lot of tape on here, but if you could see under all the other tape, there's blue tape and it is marked with half inch marks. This tape, um, it's just masking. Blue tape is just um, painter's tape. It's less sticky than regular masking tape. Um, it just gives the pipe a little bit of grab. And if your tension is turned up, the warps don't move. Um, although you will see at the top, Let's see if I can show you the top of this loom. I actually put a whole piece of tape across the top of the warp. Um, I find that once the tension is higher, the warps don't move, but um, you can put tape on it too if you want to. Sarah Sweat in the Fringeless class talks about using gaffer's tape at the bottom. I think that's like a theater tape. It's a little bit thicker and a little bit fuzzy. I think you could use like medical tape Something that just gives the copper pipe a little bit of um, friction. We'll, that's all you need to keep the warps in place. And the advantage of the tape is that you can mark on it and the marks will stay. And that's how you space the warps well, is to use, um, just mark inches or centimeters or whatever you're using to measure how many warps you get per inch. Um, Oh, Marla. Yeah, I did actually here. She's asking, um, Marla's asking, how do I space these? I actually, that's the one thing I marked on the warp. 
Um, so I took the cartoon and I put it under here. And at the beginning, before I started, I marked these on the warp. And you can actually see, I think you can see right here. See how there's three little marks? If I move the paper. There is actually another one right here. They've just, there they are. The warps roll around. So on this design, the only thing I needed to mark was these um, uh, spacings for the white lines. And I did do that on um, any kind of warp will roll as you weave. So often on my big loom, I will spend time um, rotating the warp and marking. If it's a mark I really need to see, I will rotate the warp and mark it all the way around with um, industrial Sharpie. I don't know if I have one here, I do. The Sharpie, um, their original formulation, no longer, um, they don't guarantee that it is water fast or temperature fast, but they made this new marker, um, it's probably been five years now, called Industrial, and it is supposed to be fast up to like 500 degrees Fahrenheit. So I use this to mark on my warps. Um, of course, you don't have to mark on your warps. You can put a cartoon behind what you're weaving and weave that way. Um, sometimes I weave things that I don't need um, a cartoon for. Um, I don't use any twining, Jennifer, on fringeless warps. There's no twining. And the weaving, this, these lines are just straight woven. So there isn't any twining in this piece at all. Oh, cool. Thank you for telling me how to say your name. So Anya. Like Tanya with no T, Anya. Oh, it's a beautiful name. Thank you so much. I will try to remember that next time around. I'm real bad about <laughs> remembering pronunciations, but I, I will try. All right, you guys. Um, guys, gals, whatever. That's an old habit from the 80s to call people guys. Um, should really change that. Uh, I'm so glad you, you're here and thanks for hanging out with me and um, asking great questions and I do put links to things that I talked about on the Change the Shed page on my website which is uh, tapestryweaving.com so check that out if you want a link to like I'll put a link there to Melissa Ellison Dewey's bobbin boy page so you can find where to get her bobbins and I will also link to the um, copper pipe loom um, blog posts. So those will be up in a couple hours um, or sooner. And so if you just want to find the link, that's an easy way to do it. All right, I will be back in September. Um, unless something just, I just have to show you something. If a miracle happens and I get the piece on my big loom or something, but I'll do a spontaneous change to the shed. But that would be in my newsletter, which is called Tapestry Picks. So um, I'll link to that too. <laughs> That's where I put all of the pertinent whatever I'm doing and I'll have the date on there. So thanks you guys. Thanks for, see there I did it again. Thanks for coming and hanging out with the tapestry weaving and I'll see you again in about four weeks and I will have something new on the loom to show you, on some loom to show you by then. So in the meantime, keep weaving and have so much fun with whatever you are learning and playing with and experimenting and whatever it is you're doing. And I hope it's not too hot wherever you are or too cold. Some of you are in the middle of winter. So thanks everybody. I will see you in a few weeks.